Thank you very much to the main organizer of this event for uh, the possibility to tell something about category, uh, category theory and philosophy. Uh, the time is very limited for, for today. However, I have with my very good will to present two general uh, aims. First, my aim is to present some general remarks concerning uh, category theory and classical uh, parts of philosophy, ontology, epistemology, and to tell something about uh, CT and the theories of the de development of uh, science and mathematics. And the second aim, I hope, it would be possible, it will be possible to present it also, uh, is to indicate some more special possible applications of CT uh, in philosophy, especially in the context of uh, analytic philosophy. Uh, what is CT? I, I think we can omit this part. Uh, however, uh, it's not only a theory, uh, it is also a fundamental theory and also a universal language of mathematics. Uh, however, CT is quite new theory and quite new way of thinking about and in mathematics, but there are many general uh, they share many general properties in common with, for example, set theory. Uh, what is the same? No, for example, CT is also extensional, uh, platonic and pointwise. Uh, what I mean by platonism? Uh, usually, platonism uh, is considered as a kind of conviction that there are some ideal or abstract objects which are the subject matter of mathematics. Uh, but such convictions can be explicit or implicit. And my private point of view is, the, is that the most important are implicit convictions, which manifest itself in strictly determined methods of mathematical inquiries. Uh, obviously, uh, one can see Platonism as something which is external to mathematics itself. Uh, so, uh, the mathematician can think about uh, abstract or, or ideal objects after or before his work, but the, the view is unimportant during the creation of mathematics. I think that it is important during the creation of mathematics when we consider these implicit uh, kinds of Platonism. Uh, for example, is a very well-known example given by Brewer. Uh, let us consider the decimal development of number pi. Uh, obviously, we can proceed it uh, to the infinity. Uh, however, it seems that there is a good question. Uh, is there in this development uh, the following sequence of 10 uh, numbers? If somebody thinks that this question is good, it means that he is a platonic in this hermeneutical sense, because there is a state of mathematical affairs, there is an object, say number pi, which has strictly determined properties and simply nobody knows about how it is in reality. So, this kind of conviction, for example, can be supported by the law of the excluded middle. So, 
to this kind of implicit Platonism correspond strictly determined methods. And le let us repeat, such conviction can be explicit or implicit. Uh, moreover, I think that uh, CT is the most platonic theory in the history of mathematics, in the whole history of mathematics. Why? No. It is everyday method used in CT that we treat mathematical objects as already existing, ready to use. We simply create in a wire instantly, say, a category of uh, all sets or, or small sets and so on and so on. And we can consider properties, functors, morphies between uh, such objects inside the given category on, or uh, between different uh, kinds of categories. Uh, this is totally non-constructive procedure. Uh, so, CT uses, uses uh, all the time non-constructive totalities of objects. And it is its, uh, its basic method to assume the existence of such uh, collections. Uh, however, CT enables also the study of some limits uh, of different kinds of Platonism and corresponding methods. Uh, for example, uh, this is the idea following from uh, Iji uh, that uh, uh, it seems almost obvious to everybody who knows Tarski's uh, way of constructing uh, in an axiomatic way a meta theory to the given theory, and it seems almost obvious that we can proceed. Uh, such procedure uh, and to create actually infinite tower of such theories and meta-meta theories. However, it is possible uh, to demonstrate that uh, for some classical mathematical theories, like this fundamental uh, in cosmology also, uh, theory of smooth manifolds, that assuming that there is such an infinite tower, uh, the basic theory is inconsistent. Uh, so, we can create infinite tower uh, of theories, but we have to change the logic at some finite step. We have to change classical logic on into it, uh, by, we have to replace classical logic by intuitionistic logic. Uh, moreover, Platonism is uh, important in uh, physics. Uh, and not because it is a method, but because when it is uh, considered, it needs to be delimited. For instance, uh, Usually, physicists uh, treat, uh, for example, natural numbers, uh, which can be used to number some, say, uh, quantum states, uh, as ready to use, uh, with, uh, with neglecting the existence of different models, for example, of Peano arithmetics. So, there is idea to take into consideration models of formal theories, and we have a model uh, theoretic approach to quantum gravity, which was also proposed by Iji, uh, which uh, has its, say, a kind of counterpart in a topos theoretic approach by Aisha, for example. So, repeat, CT is the most platonic theory in the history of mathematics. 
Now uh, I'm going to say only very general remarks concerning uh, this uh, ontology, epistemology uh, and the theories of the development of mathematics in the context uh, of category theory. First, I think that CT cannot add nothing more, nothing essential to the purely philosophical, ontological considerations uh, concerning the mode of existence of mathematics or mathematical objects. Uh, I think that the objects of CT are in the same way, are in the same way abstract, ideal or are objects of the same kind, kind from the ontological point of view uh, as sets or algebraic structures uh, considered in mathematics, not only in the uh, strictly formal period of the development of mathematics, but also, uh, for example, in ancient uh, mathematics. However, CT is important because it falsifies some ontological views uh, in um, philosophy of mathematics and uh, ontology of mathematics. Uh, for example, it falsifies set theoretic platonism. Uh, now, CT and epistemology only general uh, remarks. I think that also in epistemology the impact uh, of CT uh, is unimportant because, uh, because for example the problem of the epistemic access to mathematical reality is the same problem as in previous kinds of mathematics. And we can repeat again that the objects of CT uh, are in the same way abstract or ideal or non-physical as other objects of mathematics. And these objects are given to the conscious subject in the same way as other mathematical or abstract objects. However, it is a good problem to consider if CT objects are given in the same kind of conscious acts as sets, uh, algebras and so on. And nobody considered the above question. The above question. Uh, I think that uh, the approach to this problem uh, may be given by uh, the theoretical apparatus elaborated in logical investigations by Husserl. Yeah, it's a great problem in philosophy if there are some no, non-verbal, uh, purely intellectual uh, acts uh, or if mathematics or uh, other kinds of our intellectual activity are uh, connected strictly or in some part independent from the language. Uh, so uh, it's my uh, favorite example uh, to this situation. So I am going to present again a star polyhedron, uh, uh, Kepler's star poly polyhedron. And we can ask to present the existence of such nonverbal intellectual activity. We can ask how many vertices, uh, edges, or faces, faces uh, are invisible on this picture. And what we are doing, we are not talking, we are not. It's, there is no need to create a theory, a formal theory, to solve this problem, at the beginning at least, but we simply can't. We simply 
perform some purely intellectual, rational acts. And moreover, this object is not a polyhedron, it's a flat, something flat, it's a net of lines and shadows. So, in a while, without any speaking, talking and a theory, uh, we can imagine, we can create in our intuition such an object. Uh, I think that uh, at least it needs some explanation. However, it's simply de facto. I think uh, that uh, category theory uh, and the history of category theory is important, the most important, uh, in the context of the theories of the development of mathematics. Why? Because uh, we simply have some alternative form formulations of some theories, like set theory. We have uh, categorical uh, set theory and, say, ZFC uh, formulation, and, and the formulation and others. However, they are in a say equivalent. For example, it is possible uh, to demonstrate that some uh, set uh, theory, uh, that some categorical uh, formulations of uh, set theory are, uh, from the point of view of models, uh, in a sense equivalent. Moreover, Everybody, I think, knows the construction given by Lover uh, of his elementary category uh, of sets, where there is no uh, any concept of uh, y relation element uh, of the set or a set as collection uh, of elements, uh, at least at the beginning of this the theory. However, these two descriptions are uh, very similar, concern the same objects. So the, the above examples demonstrate that from the a priori point of view, set theory could appear as lower theory in the history of mathematics and not in the investment given by Cantor, Dede, Kinder, Frege because it is possible to start the creation of mathematics starting from uh, different intuitions. Uh, like these examples demonst demonstrate also that the creation of mathematics is in a sense independent from the intuitions underlying this creation. <laughs> However, on the other side, it is impossible to create something in mathematics totally without the use of intuition. So, I think it's a good problem and CT also can help in solving this problem. Uh, what is the connection between mathematical Mm, basic intuitions, given uh, context of discovery, given at the beginning of the creation of different mathematical theories. And I think again that logical investigations can be very useful also from the philosophical, uh, from the philosophical uh, point of view uh, in the consideration of this uh, question, of that question. I have some time uh, to tell something about uh, some special problems in philosophy. First, I'm going to list such problems, so which are uh, central uh, for uh, mainly for analytic ontology and analytic philosophy. Uh, so there is a question of a quantificational criterion of existence. 
There are also uh, possible theories with many existential uh, quantifiers. So there is uh, a counterpart of this uh, first problem uh, concerning ontological pluralism and uh, multi-quantificational criteria of existence. Of existence. Uh, there is a problem of canonical interpretation of extensional formal theories and intentional, possible intentional interpretations. And some specific problems important in analytic philosophy is the structure of reality analog in a sense to the structure uh, of a language or a theory. And some other variants of this problem. And is there is mathematics possible without language? Uh, first problem, only about this first problem, uh, I think I ha have time to tell something. So, uh, quantificational uh, criterion of existence uh, indicates, according to Quine, indicates simply what are uh, ontological commitments of uh, uh, scientific theories, formal theories, and simply this object uh, have to exist, which are indicated by, by the in, um, existential uh, quantifier. However, Quine argues for monism. There is only one existential quantifier, so there is only why mode or way of being. And some people try to construct theories with many existential quantifiers. And it is possible with the use of CT to construct many, to construct or to indicate many uh, counterexamples to this uh, criterion, to Quine's uh, criterion, uh, but not, not only, uh, also uh, counterexamples to the theories uh, with many uh, existential quantifiers. For example, there are categories in which quantifiers are not interpretable. Or, as also Iji remind me, that uh, in the Zariski topos uh, we have like this situation that we have existential sentence. However, we cannot infer that there is such individual uh, in the topos. So, we can say that there are uh, some inhabitant individuals and this, lead, this leads to the construction of the basal topos in which it is possible to express the fact that there is such X that something more. So, in risky topos, there is something which we have to take into account. However, we cannot indicate the existence of this object using uh, Quine's uh, criteria. Uh, as I already said, uh, the indifference of these classic, classical uh, existential quantifiers provokes to considering theories with many differential quantifiers. However, it's not uh, so straightforward because uh, at first glance uh, it, it is impossible without introducing 
uh, general uh, universal quantifiers uh, also of mm, different types and I think it's rather difficult to imagine uh, for what we need uh, such a theory however it is possible uh, and why we need many quantifiers if somebody uh, is going uh, uh, to fight uh, against monism it simply means, means that when we have two existential quantifier, the first can quantify over abstract objects and the second, for example, over sensual objects or material objects. Uh, in our paper, uh, we give two general methods of the construction uh, of such uh, multi quantificational theories. Uh, one is, the idea is uh, on this picture, uh, however it's not important at the moment, uh, it is possible to construct a, the uh, a theory with so many as we wish quantifiers, different existential quantifiers, and with one general quantifier. However, uh, these theory, uh, these theories are interpretable uh, in a theory with restricted quantifiers. So it's quite a classical uh, case. Uh, and there is a CT description of the relation of interpretability in Tarski's sense. Uh, uh, I think that everybody knows uh, what it means that two theories are interpretable or one theory is interpreted T1 is interpretable in T2 uh, from the intuitive point of view uh, it means that we can speak about the objects of the first theory inside uh, the second theory unreached with some uh, definitions of the objects uh, of the first theory. There are some interesting theorems concerning these situations. However, uh, there is, uh, we call it intuitive models, uh, general method of the construction uh, not only of the theories with many quantifiers but also of the construction of counterexamples to the Quine's criterion in all versions. So uh, what I mean by intuitive model? Mm. Maybe the picture is the best. For example, usually we work in formal frames where we have at the model only points, unspecified points. And points are different or the same and there are some relations between them. However, usually we can imagine that we substitute, for example, every point from Euclidean space by a pencil of line. If we substitute every point by something, the substitution, it means that this, this substitution is uh, general or universal and homogeneous. If we substitute only, uh, if we substitute different objects, uh, the substitution is non-homogeneous. If we substitute only some points, uh, it's local, and so on. There are, it's quite a good uh, situation. Now we can also uh, substitute, for example, a point by a straight line. And obviously, uh, there is possible. It depends. There are many possible formal theories concerning this situation because. Uh, more uh, dimensions could emerge. 
from this situation. It, it depends on the choice of our choice uh, of this uh, case and theory. Uh, an example of general description of global substitutions. So we can treat some points. There we have points, the set of points from one theory, and we have objects taken from second theory. For example, we have a collection of infinite or other of transitive models uh, of Zermelo Frankel set theory. And obviously, this set is the base space. We have Starks. Stark space, and obviously everybody knows what it is, and we can consider also all, uh, all possible uh, substitutions over the base space, and we have a topos because uh, this is a topos structure. It's not. Uh, <laughs> The general description of global substitution is it's simply leading idea in, in this, of, of course. Uh, so, one more example, global homogeneous substitution. It was used also by Iji uh, in one paper. Uh, we can substitute every point of space-time by an atomless Boolean algebra. And in this case, we have a variant of, of this first leading idea. We can construct such a topos category of shifts over R4 and so on and so on. The details are given uh, in the paper. This paper from the Foundations of Physics is very good to remember. Yeah. Uh, one more example of local substitution, which is important in uh, philosophy, because uh, it's a generator of the creation of many counterexamples to this uh, Quine's criteria. Uh, we have two copies of transitive model uh, of ZFC. So, we have two sequences of ordinals, we have two copies of infinite set, and we are going to substitute in the first model in null set one whole model of ZFC. So we are going to give internal structure to null set, which is of obviously invisible from the point of view of the first theory. And uh, how to describe this? It's, uh, how, how to create a theory which can describe this kind of substitution? A little strange, but uh, as I hope possible. Now, first of all, we have to rename the relations. Oh, it is. We have two symbols, two different symbols for an empty set. We have two relations. Epsilon, we have two re different relations of identity. We have two symbols for infinite sets. And we have first copy and the second copy and now we are going to create a formal description of this say substitutional theory where we have first model in which empty set has the structure of whole universe of this theory and obviously it is possible we have to uh, change according to, to these uh, axioms, so it's straightforward. 
And, however, we need some more axioms. For example, axiom of transitivity, because we need to have uh, every set from uh, the second copy of set theory inside the first empty set. And the usual rules, we have to change, obviously, uh, rules of substitutions, uh, and we refer to the resulting theory as a substitutional theory, which corresponds to a substitutional model. And it's not the end of our work. We have to decide many special problems, like, like this. There are many possibilities, infinite number of possibilities how to develop such a theory. However, some ideas uh, are uh, common. Mm. And it is possible uh, to demonstrate that both theories, two copies, are interpretable in this substitutional theory and there is a good categorical description of the relation of interpretability in Tarski's sense. However, I omit mm, this part. And Friedman, Friedman's concept calculi demonstrate that ZFC, ZFC can uh, can have many intentional different interpretations besides canonical uh, in sets or uh, categories. So it can be interpreted as, say, a recipe. And ontology, from this point of view, ontology appears independent, totally independent from quantification. Why? Because we can substitute, for example, in a theory with one classical quantifier, theory with many quantifiers, in the similar way. And existential quantifier cannot find any difference between these objects. So, ontology and mode of being of such objects is independent from quantification because we can we can quantify with the use of different quantifiers over the objects which uh, which have which are the same uh, It's the last picture. Uh, I only formulate some questions. Uh, and I think category theory is good in considering these questions. However, uh, it can be demonstrated in the future, not now. Thank you very much. Is like what, what does it mean? Yeah. It? yeah. I omit this picture. Uh, I said oh. it means in point pointwise models objects are of a given formal theory are simply points without any other qualities. We can differentiate between these points only by external to them relations. 
even like relation of identity. They are the same or different. And nothing more. In uh, intuitive models, uh, we can consider objects which have some properties which are not described in the initial formal theory. And usually we work in this environment, for example, uh, reading uh, a text concerning a set theory, we can imagine a set uh, as a collection of dots which are separated by some, by some special distances. Uh, however, there is uh, no, no, no word uh, uh, about uh, this special separation in set theory, for example. Uh, also, uh, from this point of view, also the concept of truth uh, in Tarski's sense of mathematical theory is such intentional decoration because there are only some relations between algebras, algebras, algebra of language and model and we only name this relation as a truth. So, as usual, I propose to postpone the test of the discussion to the break. And so, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.